Welcome back. Thank you for coming again. And on your tables, I printed out the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed. For those of you who were asking last week what they were, so you take those copies home and you can buy I really think that uh, you should dwell on this because this really is good. This, I can't pronounce it, Athanasian. Athanasian, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it explains everything a little further, you know. Yes, it's a little more detailed, like, right. I like what it says, yeah. And some repetition in it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, today, what we're going to do is we're going to be covering the sacraments, baptism and communion. And what I'd like to do is kind of just give a brief history, or first of all, definition of sacrament and the benefits, the purpose of the sacraments, and then we'll get into baptism. And then baptism, just to give a brief history, we'll be talking about infant baptism, the method of baptism, that sort of thing. And if there is time, hopefully we can talk about Holy Communion. And again, just a brief history of, of communion in, in the church, how it's practiced, and the purpose blessing from us. So that's kind of where we are headed today. We'll see how far we get. So, all right. Let's join our hearts together just in a word of prayer. Our gracious Lord, thank you for blessing us with another beautiful morning, a time that we can gather here too and to learn and to grow in our understanding of who you are and your presence and your grace at work in and through our lives. We thank you too for the sacraments that have been handed down to us over the centuries that we may continue to grow in that relationship with you as we have been baptized, as we continue to receive communion, knowing that you are present, that you are there for us. So we just ask your blessing this morning as we talk and share, and we just give thanks for being here with us. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. All right, the sacraments. Let me just give you a brief definition of some definitions of the sacrament. That's what we call <clears throat> communion, Holy Communion and Baptism. All the sacraments. Now that's not a word that you find in scripture, but it's kind of one of those, again, church words that we use to describe our understanding of, you know, Jim. At least in the Catholic Church, isn't marriage also considered sacrament? Yes, we'll get to that. They have seven sacraments. Oh, okay. So there's a bunch. Yeah. I'll explain that, right. <clears throat> So, some definitions of the sacrament, it is a sacred act, a sacred action. It's an outward sign instituted by Christ and for the means of grace, of giving grace. It's also a religious act imparting grace to us, because like when we receive communion, that grace that comes to us is that assurance of God's forgiveness. Also, if understanding that, yes, Christ is present there in and with those elements. It's also understood as a Christian rite instituted and ordained by Christ. <coughs> and we get to the Catholic sacraments. Luther disagrees with Catholics on that because he says there's only two sacraments that Christ really instituted, and that is baptism and Holy Communion. But we'll talk a little bit more about that. Sacrament can also be understood as an outward act, nurturing an inward grace. That's the intention of it. Taking earthly elements that help us, to, in a sense, to taste, see, visualize that invisible work of God in our lives, in terms of His grace and His presence. Augustine said, the sacrament is a visible form 
of an invisible grace. So that's kind of why, why we have, you know, the elements, bread and wine, water, connected with God's word, that in a sense then becomes that means of grace for us. All right. So what is the purpose of sacraments? Why do we have sacraments? Many different reasons for that. First of all, like I said, the external elements, bread, water, wine, assures, where God uses those elements to assure us of his forgiveness. So when we save the bread and the wine in communion, we can be assured that yes, this is God, in a sense, offering his forgiveness to us, claiming that we are forgiven. Also, it means uh, the sacraments by which the Holy Spirit can continue to confirm our faith in our hearts. So when we hear the word along with the sacrament, that affirmation that the Holy Spirit confirms our faith, our trust in him. It's also, we can say, a means by which the Holy Spirit nurtures and sustains the benefits of our salvation. What are the benefits? God's love, God's grace, his presence, his forgiveness of our sins, and so on. Those are the benefits that we receive through the sacraments with the help of the Holy Spirit. Also receiving the sacraments, it identifies us as Christians. Are the sacraments much shared out in our real world, in our workplaces, in our businesses? No. It's something that is done within the church community and identifies us as Christians, as a part of our Christian faith. Also, it communicates that Christ and his cross has won forgiveness, life and salvation for us. So it's another, like I said before, another way of confirming that we have that forgiveness, we have life, a new life, a regenerated life in this life, but also eternal life, our salvation. And the sacraments, in a sense, are just aids to our faith. They also help to initiate and to feed our faith. So when we come back Sunday after Sunday, say, for communion, and again, just remind it, as Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So, and again, it's just that continuing nurturing aspect of feeding our faith. And it's also a means by which God's presence comes to us in an incarnational presence of grace and salvation. Christ is not here in sense, the physical sense, but we understand that through these sacraments he is present you might say, in a spiritual way. Also, we can say the sacraments benefit because they become a statement of our unity of faith as Christians of the body of Christ. And so the sacraments are not to be seen as some rule that we have to obey or some ritual that we need to go through. Um, and, and there's a danger of doing that because if it just becomes a rule, then one's heart is not really in it. And so it's not, uh, so it's, we have to be aware of that and be careful that it doesn't just become some meaningless ritual that we go through because we don't want to sit there in the pew and everybody else gets up and goes to communion. So, well, we get up and we go to it, but yeah. So, that danger is there too. Anyway, so like I said, basically the sacraments are a means of grace. When God comes to us and pours out his love, his forgiveness to us. So just a brief history of the sacraments. First of all, Jesus initiated the sacraments, baptism and communion. Remember in Matthew 28, 1920, where he said what? Go make disciples of all nations. Doing what? 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And also then, he shared a Passover meal with his disciples the night before he was to be crucified. And in that meal, the last words he said was what? Do this in remembrance of me. So there we have, in a sense, that Christ initiated these two forms from the sacrament. Secondly, we see then how is that carried out after his ascension in Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, then you see that Peter went out and he preached at the end of his very powerful sermon. There were 3,000 people that came to faith and were baptized. Also in Acts 2, we read where there were people gathering in their own homes, breaking bread together and praying. So again, that practice of Holy Communion has started to then be a part of the Christian life. And then in the Roman catacombs, from the 1st to the 5th century, in the frescoes, there are pictures of them depicting of people, Christian people, taking Communion. So again, there's another proof that this practice was being put into place. And Tertullian, the second and third century, he was an African church father, interesting about his history. Anyway, he adopted that whole word sacraments. That's when that word sacraments then came into play at that time, around the second, end of the second and beginning of the third century. And so he said, baptism and the Lord's Supper uh, and are important and necessary rites in the, within the Christian church. By the 12th century, Hugh of um, Victor, he was a French, eminent French theologian who enumerated as many as 30 sacraments in the church. And uh, he felt that they needed to be recognized by the church. Well, then we get to the Reformation period, and so then the Catholic Church decided on seven sacraments, and the Protestants decided on two. <laughs> so that's how that kind of just developed. And for the Catholic Church, Jim, here we are. <laughs> Baptism was one sacrament, confirmation, the Eucharist, which is, means thanksgiving, or it's a communion, another name for communion, the Eucharist, repentance or penance, and also extreme unction, which means anointing the sick, or one sense the last rites for a person who is dying, marriage, and then the orders, what they call the orders, and that was the ordination of uh, men only, not women, ordination of men as deacons, priests, or bishops. So those are the seven that the um, Catholic Church still holds to today. But Luther said no, not all of them have been instituted by Christ. He said only the two, baptism and communion. And so that's what we as Lutherans then hold to those two sacraments, baptism and communion. Any questions so far? Sorry, so we're kind of rushing through here a bit today, but yes. So all and these things are more reminders of grace, not a means for grace, right? The grace is, the grace exists, and these things are physical reminders because we have this physical presence. Yes. It's, it's more than just a reminder, but yes, that's part of it. And we would say, no, it is a means why God continues to give His grace for those sacraments. It's not just a one-time sort of thing that God does, but it's a continuing giving. God continues to love us. He continues to forgive us. So, yes, so, so it is a means of grace. And being, yeah. So it is a symbol, but not just a symbol. Pardon? It is a symbol, but not, but not just a symbol. No, it's not a symbol. 
That's when we would agree, disagree as Lutherans, and I'll come to that. Yeah, some churches say yes, it's just merely a memorial or a symbol, mm -hmm. and I'll explain that a little bit more. So, yeah. yeah okay. Does the frequency have anything of significance? Different churches take communion more frequently than others. Is there uh, an issue with frequency, or is that no, just no, no, it's not. Martin Luther said, every time you gather to worship, you should have communion. Mm -hmm. But it depends on the congregation and the leadership, how they want to do that. Some have it every Sunday or offer it every Sunday. Maybe they have two or three different services, but at least one of the services there is communion. Uh, some say twice a month. Some say traditionally before when I was growing up, it was considered so sacred, maybe four times a year only. Well, but again, Luther says. In the early church of Paul, it was, as you say, every time they got together. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like when I grew up, we always had to go and announce it you know, on a Saturday before that you want to take it. Why was that? Why, why, did we, why did we do that? I mean, we, they don't do it anymore, but when I grew up, that's it. Parents always had to go on Saturday and announce they want to take communion. And apparently, you yeah, know. and that kind of comes out of the Catholic tradition a bit in terms of confession. So if you wanted to take confession or communion on Sunday or Mass, then you would go to confession first. Oh, okay. And so the Lutherans kind of picked up on that for a while. And Missouri Synod Lutheran Church kind of held on to that tradition for quite a while. It's kind of just gone by the wayside to a certain extent. So now to replace that, usually at the beginning of the service or right before communion, we have a corporate confession together as people. So again, this morning you'll see that just before we give communion, there will be that period of confession for us. So that's kind of replaced that Saturday evening. Yeah. Gary, uh, Christ said, go into the world, baptizing my name. But well, wasn't John the Baptist baptizing before that? How does that Yes, work? that was, his was different. It was a baptism of repentance, John the Baptist. So people, and it wasn't, the, in a sense, the full meaning of baptism didn't, was not completed until Christ died and rose again. Okay. It's a different form in a sense. It's a turning in a sense so that you're open to this Christ that is coming. Right. John's baptism was a traditional Jewish baptism of cleansing. Yes, purification and cleansing, right. Yeah, it kind of came out of that, influenced by that. Okay, yeah. Your last, second last statement. Is that why Jesus says go, therefore, and baptize all the nations at the end of Matthew instead of someplace during his ministry before he was crucified? Because, like you said, the, the baptism is, is completed with his death and resurrection. Okay, I'm not quite understanding what you're saying, so kind of um, rephrase that. Uh, Jesus could have picked up from uh, John the Baptist on baptizing and tell everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was the night before, I guess, when he started communion too. But um, he could have been saying that through his ministry, go back and you know, be baptized. But it was at the very end. Yes. Before the very end. He said that. Yes, because God's com forgiveness was completed yeah. on the cross in His resurrection, and that's why Christ came to complete that that means of grace for us. And so then, yes, then now we can. In a sense, the baptism and communion have the meaning. Well, one of the Gospels mentions that Jesus' disciples were also baptizing, like John's disciples were baptizing. Jesus wasn't doing it, yeah. but a disciple. Yeah. But it was it was a repentance baptism. Yeah, it's more of a cleansing, that. right? Ritual baptism. Yeah, yeah. So communion is kind of like reminder of why he did it, and the baptism is the completion of, mm -hmm. of yeah. grace. Yeah. Okay, good question. All right, just a brief history of baptism. How 
how did it come about, and so on. And again, as I said, Jesus initiated baptism. I mean, he was baptized himself, right? By John the Baptist. Okay. But also, we have shadows of baptism even in the Old Testament. So, 1 Peter, let me read that to you. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, hell, in a sense, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. It is only a few people, eight in all, who were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. So, again, Peter is referring to the significance of water, even back in the Old Testament when it comes to baptism. And again, as you mentioned, Jim, I mean, there were those Old Testament rituals of purification and cleansing. <clears throat> and uh, and they call it, I think it's the Jewish Mekua, the Jewish Mekua, which meant that there was an immersion into water for that cleansing and purification. And we even see that in just in the time of the Essenes, too, uh, where they had these purification pools and that they would go through and also the ritual of cleansing. So, and then it also we find in Colossians 2.11 another reference to to the beginnings of baptism. Colossians 2.11 In him you were sick circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with his circumcision done by the hand of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the, in the power of God who raised him from the dead. So I think we can say there seems to be some evidence that in the Old Testament, circumcision was that sign that you now are a part of God's people, that God claims you as his own. But in the New Testament, for the Christians, that's not carried on. Instead, it's baptism. So baptism now replaces that ritual of circumcision. And that is the sign, the seal, that we are a part of God's family. That's through our baptism. Baptism applies to ladies too. Or yes. Circumcision yes. 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 Right. It's all inclusive. So yeah. So again, like I said, there's kind of those shadows of baptism in the Old Testament now has been carried over, and we find that in through the baptism that Jesus has completed for us. Also in Acts two, as I mentioned, again after Peter's sermon, there were three thousand people who came to faith and were baptized. And in eight, Acts 8, 26, remember Philip meets the Ethiopian on the road and baptizes him. Right. Acts 10, 47, 48, Cornelius' household is baptized. And also in Acts 16, 15 and 33, Lydia's household and the jailer's household are baptized. So again, there we have those evidences of <clears throat> baptism happening. And then also, uh, in the Didache, that also encouraged baptism to happen. The Didache was an early manual 
believed to be written probably by some of the apostles of just some Christian instructions on how to live out your faith. And that came about in about 70, between 70 and 100 AD. It's a very, very old document. And uh, again, it's called the 12 Apostles' Teachings. And, and there you find some instructions about how to baptize. So that's another evidence then that baptism was continuing to be used and practiced. Also in the Roman catacombs, there is, uh, like I said, frescoes that depicting these images of people being baptized. So even in the early church, early history of the church, baptism in some form or purpose was being then practiced in the Christ early Christian church. Now it's interesting because if you go back and look at some of these other countries, there was some form of baptism, and I don't understand how or what or why completely, but in early Mesopotamia, the Egyptians, Eastern religions, Islam, Buddhism, Shintoism, there have been traditionally, I guess, some form of baptism. So it's not just something unique to the Christian church. So. I think when, when <clears throat> you're talking about what the apostles talk about baptism, yeah. certainly different than when we do it here. The sprinkling of water, I mean, okay, you got a little bit of a history of there of that? I'm coming to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because it, I'm sorry, I'm behind you, all your questions. Anyway. We're just anxious. <laughs> okay. So let me just, so what's the purpose of baptism? Why do we baptize? What's Titus 3, verses 4 through 6, I think is a very good explanation. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 6, which reads, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. Baptism, that's how we understand that. Washing of rebirth. And the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. So there, again, it's to establish a covenant. Baptism is to establish, establish a covenant relationship with God and with his family, with his people. That's the intention of that. And with that bit, baptism, <clears throat> we receive gifts. God gifts us through our baptism with a seed faith, because as we say in our creed, we cannot, on our own reason or understanding, come to faith in Him. We need help. And so He, in a sense, plants that seed faith in us. Also, the gifts of His forgiveness, peace, joy, promises of His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then helps us to grow in our faith, our understanding helping to nurture that trust in Him. And He gives us His love and the promise of His presence in every day. So when we are baptized, God is saying, I love you. You belong to me, and I promise to be with you and to help you in whatever way I can so that you can remain strong in your trust and faith in me. So, Baptism also is a, might say, <clears throat> a regeneration as we grow in faith. It initiates us into his kingdom. We become full members of the church of Jesus Christ. And then we get all the benefits that God has to offer because of that. That's his promise. And then his will for us. It marks us, claims us, and follow us, he follows us as our life unfolds. And so, in a sense, it's that sign, that action, that event where God then declares his love for us 
and continues to work his forgiveness in, in, through us. And works forgiveness, works forgiveness, that means that that's something that's always in the process <laughs> because of our sinful nature. It doesn't mean that once we're forgiven, we'll never sin again. No. But that forgiveness is continually there as we come and turn to Him in repentance. So in a sense, then, God just takes ordinary water, and with His Word, His Word of promise, His Word of grace, and then makes us his child, one who belongs to him and his family. So, is baptism necessary for salvation? No. No. It's not necessary, but it is certainly encouraged. And because remember what Luther said, sola fide, faith alone. <laughs> The outward sign of an inward change. Baptism, I'm sorry. The outward sign of an inward change. <coughs> yes, yes, yeah, that's, that's right. So, no, baptism is not a guarantee of our salvation. And I know traditionally when I was growing up too, I've heard parents say, well, they need to get my kids to baptize so that they're saved. No, <laughs> that's not how it works. So, it's faith and baptism. Mark 16, those who believe and who are baptized will be saved. So yes, faith helps us. Our baptism helps our faith, yes. And God is the one who's a judge in the end, right? God is the one who judges the heart of everyone, so. Well, Cornelius, the uh, spirit was poured out in his house. Yeah. And Peter said, gee, if God did that, how could I reduce that to? Yeah. Yeah. So what about you, baptism? Okay. <coughs> baptism. Let's talk about that. It comes from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo. Which can be translated literally a religious rite of immersion or dipping in water, or pouring of water on the head, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? A lot of people interpret that as meaning, according to some scripture passages, that we need to be immersed under water. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but yes, that's one form that we as Lutherans accept. But baptizo is a symbolized symbolism of a covenant, a relationship with God, a regeneration from our sinful nature. It's an adoption into God's family is what that baptism means. It's a Christian into the Christian faith. In a sense, it's a water of purification, of cleansing. It symbolizes a person dying to one's past and then rising of life and beginning a new and dedicated life to God when we are baptized. So where God himself joins his word, his word of promise, to a visible element. So whenever there's a baptism, there needs to be water and the word of God. And again, God saying, you know, I love you, you're mine, etc., etc. <coughs> So the use of water is not so much the amount of water. <laughs> Others would argue against that. Luther said, baptism is not just plain water, but water included in God's command and combined with God's word. So there needs to be those two things when it comes to baptism. So again, baptizo, immersion, the dipping in the water or pouring of the water is how that's understood. All right, infant baptism. Why do we baptize infants as 
Why is this a practice in the Lutheran Church? Let me give you a little bit of a history about that. All right? <clears throat> it happened in the early church. It happened in the early church. Acts 15, as I mentioned, verses 16 32. Lydia's household was baptized. Now, it doesn't say explicitly that there were children, but in a sense, it can be assumed there were probably younger people in her household that time in the jailer's house. So that's just an assumption there. An early church father, Origen, 185 AD, said, I am thankful I was baptized as an infant. He said, children should be baptized. So, who said that? Origen. O-R-I-G-E-N. Yeah, I was just reading this morning a little bit about Origen. It wasn't good. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. So, and there were a couple other church, early church fathers, too, in that first century, who said they were baptized as children. So that was a practice that was already there in the early Christian church. Tertullian, at the end of the 2nd and 3rd century, I mentioned him before, he, in a sense, didn't really object to infant baptism, but he said it's better for a person to be baptized when they were older, so that the lustful sins of the youth wouldn't soil baptism. <laughs> That's what he said. So he was full sins of middle age. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his take on it. And anyway, Augustine in 350 AD, he went back and he rested on the apostolic authority of, in the Didarchaic. He said they were baptizing infants in the early church, and he followed with that, and so he felt that infant baptism was acceptable. Then again, in the baptismal frescoes of the Roman catacombs from the 1st century to the 5th century, there are these frescoes that show children being baptized. Archilla, baptized, one year, five months. Artisus, eight months old. Raphilio, he was three years old, 30 days. So we have those, you might say, archaeological evidences of infant baptism that was happening in the early church. Also, it was felt around the second century that sometimes, because of the high mortality rate, people said we need to baptize our children. And again, it was not safe to put a young infant completely underwater. And so, again, this whole idea of pouring water and baptizing them at an early age. Because they were afraid if they weren't baptized, they would go to hell. So that was part of their reasoning. And it became a practice then of infant baptism. So what was the purpose of infant baptism in the very, very early church? Okay, Luther felt that infant baptism had these benefits, that God's grace embraced the infant right at the beginning of life. That was the intention, the nature of God's grace, to reach out and claim them as his own. Well, baptizing because they were afraid they would die early, that it, it doesn't save the children. The children aren't saved, they don't receive salvation, do not receive right. salvation by baptism. And baptism is, based on what's been said, is an outward sign of having accept, accepted Christ. To a certain extent, yes. And it indicated that. It doesn't depend solely on accepting Christ, no. Because but, of God's grace. He claims us as an infant before we can even understand or understand who he is. His grace comes through baptism and claims us as his own. Well, I think most, maybe a lot of people would believe that infants before the age of, uh, um, what's my, uh, are saved automatically. Yeah. Before the age of knowledge. Yeah. 
So it did depend that baptism doesn't depend on our knowledge or understanding. So anyway, let me continue to explain a little bit more here. So Luther felt too this was just God's work. God takes the initiative in baptism. It's not that we come to God and say, all right, baptize me. God is the one who reaches out initially because of his love and grace for us and says, I want you to be a part of my family. But do you understand that or not? Or do you know what that means or not? And so right at infant baptism, he reaches out with his grace. How many of you, you having children, how long do you wait before you accept them into your family? Uh, yeah. You wait till they're old enough to understand <laughs> them, how hard you love them. And, no, I think for most of us, right from the beginning, conception, we have a love, a desire to claim that infant as our own. Right? You see, that's the nature of God's grace. He doesn't wait. He is so eager to love us and embrace us, and so in an infant baptism, He comes to us. And he accepts the Santa own. So that's an illustration of the key difference between Christianity and religion. You say, you know, churchianity would be us reaching up to God trying to be worthy. Yeah. Whereas Christianity is God reaching down to man and saying, I want you. Yeah. That's the purpose of God sending Christ into the world. We didn't ask him to do that. He just, because of his love and desire for us to be in a right relationship with him. Sent Christ. So, so, baptism not only initiates us into the life of Christ, but provides the ongoing spiritual nurturing of life by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We believe that one of the gifts in infant baptism, or any baptism, is we receive the Holy Spirit, who begins then to help us to grow in our faith. So, God plants that seed faith. It's not conditioned. Conditional on our understanding, no. In Galatians 3, 27, all baptized are into, into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So. Now, this is the Lutheran position. Some of you may not agree, but again, that's where we stand. And there is some archaeological evidence as well that the infant baptism happened uh, early on in the Christian church. I need, unfortunately, to end here. <coughs> Sorry, but if we can pick this up next week and uh, continue discussing this. Can we say that baptism used in the Bible refers to war baptism and not baptism by the Holy Spirit in every case? Just what? The baptism that we read in the scripture refers to war baptism and not baptism by the Holy Spirit. There are two different baptisms. Yes, in Acts we find that there were believers later were baptized with the Holy Spirit. But there is the water baptism, and there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right. So when we say that the entire household was baptized, are we talking about water or the Holy Spirit? Water. So the word baptism used in that sense <coughs> That's my understanding. Unless the Holy Spirit is explicitly invoked. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sorry, I have to cut short, but I've got to go. Oh, it is <laughs> Thank you.